Welcome to the winter 2017 edition of the North Attleboro Electric Show. Peter Gay, and we always start out with GM's Corner, the general manager of North Attleboro Electric, Jay Moynihan. Jay, uh, North Attleboro Electric, their fiscal year is actually the calendar year, so uh, new budget year uh, and CIPs, I guess, we'll be talking about to start off this edition. Uh, yeah, so the Board of uh, Electric Commissioners um, at their uh, meeting on uh, January 18th uh, approved a new uh, budget in the capital improvement plan. Uh, the way the statute works is it's the um, Board of Electric Commissioners who do that, who are the three-member elected board. Uh, it's not town meeting, it's the Board of Electric Commissioners because uh, NAD it operates under a separate statute. Uh, so the budget approved by the Electric Commissioners this year is about 33800000 of which about $23, $24 million of that is directly related to power expenses. So the power expenses include the cost of the energy, the transmission uh, charges that we have to the market, um, as well as the distribution charges and um, customer charges related to the operation of our facility day-to-day. Uh, -day. So all of that is um, approved by the board. It's about $33,800,000. Uh, uh, the power expenses this year are down about $1.4 million from last year. Uh, power expenses generally um, are market-driven for us. Um, we have some charges with regards to the market, uh, what they call capacity charges, to make sure that the ISO New England area, the New England transmission area, has sufficient capacity uh, if it's needed um, so that they avoid brownouts and things like that. Um, but by and large, the, uh, uh, the budget will be... Uh, uh, reflects what we uh, uh, believe is going to happen, and we think the energy numbers are good for where we are right now. Uh, from a capital planning standpoint, the uh, capital plan is about $7.4 million, much higher than in the past, but most of that, about $5.5 million of it or so, is uh, oriented to the upgrade of the substation, uh, which is a, a huge project for us, um, which I think the uh, uh, show later on will provide some additional information on that. Um, we have some other uh, interesting projects next year. Um, in addition to the uh, uh, substation, uh, we'll be doing some analysis work on uh, solar in our community. Uh, we'll be looking at the possibility of developing a community solar facility behind North Attleboro Electric Department's substation. Uh, we'll be uh, taking a look at the upgrade, uh, updating a study done in 2009 of solar on the municipal landfill site. Uh, we'll look at that. Uh, we also will be working, uh, looking forward to uh, instituting another um, survey of our customers. Uh, this year will be the residential survey. Uh, last year we had our commercial industrial and um, did very well with our customers, for which we're grateful. We utilized some of that information in developing our budget. Um, so we'll be uh, taking a look at uh, uh, doing uh, some of that. Uh, in addition to that, we will be doing a good deal of planning. We have a process. Uh, where we try to think 10 years out. Um, so we have what we call um, NAD 2027. In 16, it was 2026. We've moved on. Uh, we try to take a look at what the uh, uh, facility will be, what services the customers will be looking for us to provide, what services we think we can be helpful with. Uh, that will be part of our planning process also as we um, uh, go forward in um, uh, 2017. So we have a lot of interesting and exciting projects, both capital and operational. Um, and as always, you know, our effort will be on providing quality uh, services to our, uh, our customers, both on a day-to-day -day basis as well as from an emergency standpoint. Winter traditionally the time of year that the planning is done and then spring, summer, fall when the majority of the work is done? Yeah, we'll start uh, planning and then panic will set in probably by <laughs> April or May. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, from a standpoint of uh, the way we operate in our process, we're very strong on, uh, on planning. Um, so planning probably for the most part would take place at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year thinking f going forward for the next year. So our budget and our capital plan um, always try to reflect uh, a good deal of uh, consideration for the projects that come up in that year and then thinking about projects long range for, for where we can be. Uh, so we can avoid as much as possible, although you can never get away from it entirely, um, 
a situation where you're just doing knee jerk. We try to plan these things out, think about them in a period of year or two or three, and uh, that really helps our focus. North Attleboro Electric General Manager Jay Moynihan kicking off the winter edition of the North Attleboro Electric Show. We've moved into the office of operations manager Gene Allen. Gene, a uh, couple months into the new year, uh, let's talk about some of the projects that will take place this year. Um, well, as you know, um, we've been working on a new um, circuit going over to the west side of town. It's going to be called E16. Uh, the last phase of that uh, will be constructed this year. All the design work has been completed. It's basically re-energizing the old transmission or sub-transmission line that used to feed the Whiting Street um, substation. We're going to re-energize that at our normal uh, primary uh, voltage of 13.8 and that's going to uh, feed that side of town. It, it's a more of a reliability issue. So we'll be doing some work um, in the cross-country section. We'll be reducing some of the higher poles and when we get closer to Whiting Street to the lower poles and running down Park Street. So that should probably start in the next two to three weeks we'll get over there and start depending on weather and we should be finishing that up early in the summer. Oh, I believe you also have a project in the, the Cliffs area? Uh, the Cliffs area we um, are going to be on the east side of town. Um, we now have E10 and E9, those are our two circuits over there. We split that, as you remember, a couple of years ago. Now we're trying to bring backup feed into there. We want to be able to have four circuits into that area for redundancy and reliability. So we permitted through National Grid last year to cross at the end of Cliff Drive and go over and up through the uh, park. So what we'd like to do is finish that design, go out to bid and get that conduit installed. Uh, this year and then we'll do the wiring next year. Uh, are these type of projects the reason why after a hurricane, after a blizzard, there's sections of Massachusetts, large sections that lose power, but maybe only one or two homes in North Attleboro lose power? How are all about reliability? It, our bottom line is reliability at a reasonable cost. And what we do is we um, go out and we say, where's the weakest part of our system? And then we go and we try to strengthen that part of the system. Um, it's not so much after the storm, it's during the storm. You don't want to have poles that are coming down, wires that are coming down. That's why we do such an extensive trimming and tree removal program, because uh, usually that's what causes a lot of the outages um, when you come to electricity. Um, in, in other parts of the town. You have trees that come down and take the wires down, um, poles that break. We try to get on top of that. We inspect through our maintenance programs, which we've gone over in the past. We go out and we inspect all the poles. Uh, once every five years, we've inspected every bit of the infrastructure in town. And if we find a problem, we repair it. We don't let it sit there. And I think by doing that, it um, gives us uh, very good reliability. But also, if there is a problem in the system, we want to be able to go to a backup, and and that is uh, part of putting E16 in, much like when we did a couple of years ago when we did um, circuit E9. When we're done with this, if a circuit is um, rated at 600 amps, under maximum load, we'll only have 300 amps on it. So what that allows us to do, and when I say maximum load, July and August when it's 95 degrees for three days, you have that's usually when your your, your maximum loads are. But it, if we had an outage at that particular point, the adjoining circuits can handle the entire load of that circuit. So we can shift all the load in a matter of a few minutes or you know 30 minutes so you don't have that long duration of an outage because we can shift the majority of the load off to other areas while we do the actual repair. I know uh, one of the projects we talked about, and it, it's a very detailed project, is uh, upgrading the Sherman substation. We spoke about that. It was either the, the last edition of the North Attleboro Electric Show or the edition before that. Uh, I understand uh, that project moves forward this year. It does. We actually have uh, a couple of bids out right now that we're reviewing. Um, the uh, new substation, uh, substation or power transformer is uh, has been bid and the switch gear has been bid and we also have uh, probably over the next month we'll go out with uh, some 115 uh, equipment and then we'll have the contract that will be in the spring um, that will go out so all this will come to construction that will start probably August September time frame and then the transformer and the switch gear will be delivered sometime in probably October and November um, and we should have it all energized 
probably early part of 2018. The primary goal behind this is, isn't because we need to increase our load uh, capabilities, but a couple of transformers that we have over there now are from uh, vintage 1969. Um, we've got our useful life out of them. Uh, before they break down and fail, we want to make sure that you know we're at the end of the life, let's replace them and, and plan for uh, the next uh, 50 years worth of power. And as I understand it, the, the footprint will be larger. Um, the, the actual substation itself, we're not going outside the existing boundaries. Okay. Uh, we're removing two old transformers and we're replacing them with one because we didn't have the double step down. Or we had the double step down in the, in the past from the 115 to 69 and then 69 down to 13.8. This is just going to be from 115, which is the primary voltage coming in from the grid, down to our primary voltage, which is 13.8. So it's a less of a footprint as far as that okay. type of equipment. The switch gear is going to be probably three or four times larger than what we have right now because it's going to be handling more circuits. And uh, once again, we'll just, uh, the key word being reliability. There you go. That's it. Gene Allen, Operations Manager here at North Attleboro Electric. We've moved downstairs to the office of Chris Mitchell, Project Manager here at North Attleboro Electric. We're talking fiber, fiber upgrade, something that uh, I know that the town was talking about doing their own fiber upgrade, but turns out North Idaho Electric is uh, doing one which will certainly benefit the town. Yes, it will. Um, we started out in 2004 when the fiber network that currently serves the town was built with this. This is what's called a tree and branch. Basically, the head end is here and everything runs out from there. Problem here is if you get a branch falling off, everybody who's connected to that branch is offline. Use of the Muni net is accelerated as the town uses more and more data and has more and more applications that can be enhanced further by better connectivity. Security cameras, voice over IP to lower telephony costs, all good things that are worthwhile in the town budget. These are things that um, require a little more resiliency. North Attleboro Electric does as well. So retro building, if you will, we're going to, over the next two to three years, beginning this year, build out sections of the network to begin to build a loop around so we have resiliency. If something fails over here, it will have a path back. The biggest build this year is going to come through the industrial park from the head end, which is out in the upper parking lot here. Yeah. You've been there before to point on Commonwealth Avenue. We'll also be connecting switches at the mall so we can monitor and maintain those remotely for engineering and for operational purposes. This is an underground plant. The rest of this is aerial. Underground, that means we're pulling it through conduit at the mall. So this section, all of this is planned for this year. We've been working with fire alarm, um, with the fire department regarding pulling their old alarm cable and putting the fiber up in that space. We've begun the make ready work working with a couple different firms. When we're done, this is basically what you're going to have. We are going to, next year and the year after, build additional loops out. So we're making essentially a circuitous connection. So this will have the ability to have traffic go back its normal way and the other way. So if we get a break here, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, not everything over here fails. And we're building out connection through downtown, so there's additional resiliency for the cluster of town departments here. I mean, the core of town departments are really located in this area. So the idea is to provide, A, enough fiber so town can use additional services that it needs. We have resiliency for those. We have resiliency for ours. Gives us more flexibility with this reaches more points, and generally builds out a better quality fiber loop. That's the goal. And that's going to be done over a two to three year period. We'll be building out primarily, um, the connections will be using a 48 count fiber. That's what this is. Um, this will be hung typically up in the air. There'll be some underground, not a lot. You'll see additional Splice points being added. Splice points got a couple, three different parts. That's the body of the torpedo. This will be a splice tray with a section that will fit back in. And this 
tail whip basically is where the fibers fed in. The fibers get parsed out in here. Parsed out, plain English. Um, we take the individual strands and we connect them up. That's where they go. Back out and around. So, so. not only will, God forbid, a branch come down that the system doesn't go down, but uh, with this new fiber, will it be faster? Uh, fast is really controlled by the endpoints, okay. and that's another thing we're working on in my fiscal 2018. Um, I was uh, granted approval to start looking at higher bandwidth equipment for the MuniNet. Right now, the gear we're using has been in place since 2004, and while it's gigabit Ethernet connection, that's great, but more use means more bandwidth is needed. So we're looking at the next step to either 10 or 40 gig um, and we'll be working with various vendors this year, testing devices out in the field to see what we like, what we don't like, what works and what doesn't work. Bandwidth is useful. The more of it you've got, the better off you are. Um, trying to cram a lot of different data over one single connection, not always a good idea. So more data, let's get more bandwidth. So certainly a worthwhile, worthwhile project, not only for North Attleboro Electric, but for the town of North Attleboro as well. The key word being reliability, and this will certainly uh, help that. We've moved into the office of Administrative Assistant Michelle Dobson to discuss energy efficiency, something people always think about during the dead of winter. And Michelle, I understand uh, in addition to the existing programs, there are two new programs introduced at NAED this year. That's right. Um, in 2017, we added uh, programmable thermostats, which was very important to some of our customers. We learned that uh, through some research that they're looking to get rebates on that. And also LED light bulbs. Um, so the thermostat gives a $25 rebate, and light bulbs is 50% up to $150. That is pretty good. That's a good one. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the existing programs that people might not know about? Um, the appliance rebate programs is um, to all uh, residential customers. Uh, so there is rebates for um, refrigerators, uh, washer and dryer, uh, dishwasher, I believe is one of them, room air conditioner, dehumidifier. So the new forms are up on our website and um, you can just um, mail them to me. We also uh, put up our email address this year um, for ease of sending information. So we need the form and the receipts and we'll be able to send you a check back in about six to eight weeks. I remember it might have been last year, might have been the mm -hmm. year before we've been doing this program for a few years. Yeah. Uh, uh, during the winter, people wondering about how much energy are they losing in their homes. These uh, rebates certainly help, mm -hmm. but uh, are energy audits still available? And uh, is this yeah. the time of year to do them or not do them? I would assume everybody wants one now. Right, this is definitely the time to do it before it gets too busy. Um, the home improvement rebate program is just that. So you do um, apply for an audit. It's free of charge to all our customers. And again, it's residential customers. Um, they come in, they actually do an audit of your home. Um, they go over the lighting, the heating, the cooling, all of that. Um, and there are incentives for uh, windows and doors, also um, insulation and that type of thing. Um, but we do request that you have an audit done first. Okay, and there's no charge no for the charge audit. For that. Now, of course, the question comes up, okay, uh, if there's no cost, well, somebody must be paying for it, right? NAED is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we take um, care of that course. That's a part of our budget for the year. So um, we feel that it's a good way to um, help the customers uh, make some decisions that would help them save energy. So. And once again, if anyone has any questions, can they can they call you? Are absolutely. you free to speak to? Yep, absolutely. You can call me or email me. Um, the information is also up on our web page too. Okay. And um, this year we're doing the Facebook page, so all the information is up on that also. Social media. Social media. We're trying. <laughs> we're trying hard. <laughs> yeah. N A E D. Michelle Dobson, uh, administrative assistant here at North Attleboro Electric. <laughs> We're with two of the system engineers here at North Attleboro Electric, John Miller and Peter Schiffman, discussing 
LED lights on poles. And the only reason I know about this is I read in the Sun Chronicle that North Attleboro Electric, North Attleboro, received a grant to replace lighting with uh, lighting that's more efficient. Uh, now, as you said, John, before we started this interview, this isn't the first time NAED has done this. No, we're always looking to make uh, improved efficiencies as much as possible. Uh, way back in the 1890s, we were the first utility, I believe, to use incandescent street lights all over the whole, whole system. So that was the first start. Over time, we switched to something called mercury vapor lighting, which is an improvement, significant improvement. I don't know if you saw the white lighting that was out there. Uh, more recently, say 10 plus years ago, we switched everything to what's called high pressure sodium, which is that kind of orange light. Uh, that was the state of the art at the time, lowest cost, uh, highest efficiency. And now there's a new technology, which people probably know about a little bit, the light emitting diode or LED lighting. And it's finally being applied to street lighting. And we're looking to adopt that system wide uh, to, uh, in, for maintenance purposes. It's much better and also at a lower cost. Peter, what type of uh, savings are we talking uh, for the town of North Attleboro? Well, um, as part of this grant program, uh, they're estimating, which is the Department of Energy Resources and the Baker administration, uh, anywhere from 30 to 70 percent, depending on the wattage and type of bulb. But obviously that's vendor specific, that's bulb specific. We have 50 watt bulbs, we have 100, 150, 250, and 400 watt floodlights. Um, that we'd be looking into um, as part of this. Uh, right now, I mean, the vast majority of the installations that we have are 50 watt high pressure sodium bulbs, which burn, uh, uh, you think 50 watts, but there's a ballast in there, so you add another 10, maybe 15 watts, so 65. Some of the LED replacement bulbs that we're going to be evaluating and then installing claim to be within the 30 to 40 watt range. So right there, some, in some cases, it could be 50% savings uh, of energy savings. The cost obviously depends on what the current cost of electricity and other things, uh, other factors that are involved, and that has to be calculated out. But energy efficiency-wise, we can say 30 to 50% on some of our installations that we want to see. Um, John, how, how long of a project is this, and when will residents start to notice, hey, the, the street lights are different? We haven't evaluated which fixtures or how we're going to do this as yet. There's a grant process involved with the state. They have certain requirements. Uh, once everything's approved and ready to go, there's a fairly rapid uh, time to install to the state's mandating. It's a little over a year, I believe. Uh, so. I'm not sure exactly when this would start, but may, let's say six months, and then we would have like a year or so, and the whole town would be switched over. That's the current understanding of how we would proceed. Yeah, right now the grant is actually, um, we have to have everything installed by June of 2018. There are 12 municipals uh, municipalities total that are included under this grant through Energy New England. DOER also has another grant program that they've, they're working on with other Massachusetts utilities included with towns that are part of IOUs like Eversource and National Grid. So this is specifically for the municipalities and the municipal light plants. Uh, so we're fortunate enough to be able to get into this grant program, which is going to allow us 50% of the material costs. doesn't include labor. So as we go through the process, the materials of LED light bulbs uh, and street lighting has reduced every year. So every time we start to see new vendors and, and new new products come out, the prices keep going down and down and down. So uh, right now, a fixture is anywhere from $100 to $150, and 50% of that would be covered. Also as part of this, uh, we're looking at potentially getting smart controls, which allow us to do more than what's happening today is called dusk to dawn. So at night, the light comes on, and in the morning it shuts off. We actually want, and we're investigating this, we want to be able to control all the lights from a central system, monitor all the lights at once, and these also have dimming functions. So going from 100% to, say, 70% is, it's perceptible by the human eye, but it still gives you quite a bit of light. So Cambridge, for instance, is dropping from I think 100% down to 50% after midnight, and they're getting additional savings. So that's something that we want to look into as well. 
John, you mentioned uh, you know years ago that the orange, the the yellow lights that people associate with street lights. Mm -hmm. Well, these have more of a uh, a white color to them, and because not everyone likes that. Yeah. One of the problems with LED lighting in its simple form is it's extremely white. I personally find that somewhat problematic. I don't like the glaring white color. However, now the street lights that they're making, they have something called color temperatures, which I won't get into too much, but there's a whole range from very, very white to not just a better, a little bit more white than what we have right now. So we're going to pick a light that's called 3000 degree Kelvin, uh, which is kind of a little bit of an orange color to it, and that'll replace the ones on side streets and so forth. But on the high, major highways, we're thinking you use something called 4000, which is pretty white. Uh, the white of the light, the better you can see, but the more glaring it is, I guess might be a way to say it. So we're trying to evaluate what the best color is that won't, it's most, you know, people will find the most comfortable. And we're three, thinking right now, 3000 degree, what's called for side streets and small streets, and 4000 for highways. Uh, the current lights are what's called 2700, if you can kind of picture that on a scale. Now, no, Peter, I know there's been some communities where residents have complained they don't like the new lights, uh, they're too bright. Yep. Um, whether it's a complaint of being too bright, too glaring in the window, too white, not bright enough. Sometimes we've gotten, we've heard of those types of things. So we're anticipating lots of uh, questions. And these are the questions that we're asking, not only Energy New England, we're asking, we're going to have to ask each vendor, how are they dealing with that? We've gotten a lot of answers. We've gotten a lot of information that a lot of their technicians are taking back, looking at the American Medical Association's uh, info, information that they put out on blue light and its effects on human health. And they're actually doing some studies to see, and, and they have very interesting comparisons between your television set and your phone mm. having much more blue light output than your traditional bulb. But as John was saying, the whiter it is, the more blue light there is. So a lot of communities are going to that 3,000 Kelvin bulb, which we're really um, focusing around for our residential neighborhoods. The 4,000 Kelvin, if you see those on the main roads, it just gives you greater visibility. So certainly a project uh, North Attleboro Electric is uh, working on, and uh, you will start to see the results sometime in the near future.